Hi, I'm Dan Griffin, and I'm going to be studying the Bible with you for the next few minutes. You may have seen me around. I live in Guilford, New Hampshire, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I've been going to the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church for approximately 15 years. I'm in Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church right now, where we're going to make a, a few discussion points about Laconia, which is the church has been here for about the past 30 years. Before we begin, let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you as we open your word, asking that you would guide us, protect us, and most of all, may your Holy Spirit be here this, this day as we study your word. We want to know more about you as our creator. We want to know more about you as we study closely and seek more to know about you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible poses a question that we all ask in one form at some point in our lives. We can find that question in Psalm 8, 3, and 4. Let's turn in our Bibles to that text. Psalm pretty much is in the middle of the Bible. Chapter 8, verses 3 through 4. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Here King David stands in wonder at the vastness of the universe and he feels quite small by comparison. And yet, he also has a sense that he is hugely significant in God's estimation. The question David has is simple, yet profound. What is our essential identity as mankind, and why is God so interested in us? One popular story about humanity goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was nothing, no time, no space, no matter. Then suddenly, about 13.9 billion years ago, there was a massive explosion from nothingness. And from nothing came everything, including us. Life is a biological fluke generated by a blind, brutal evolutionary process devoid of any transcendent meaning or lasting significance. We live by the law of selfishness. We grab all we can we die, and that's it. In due course, the human race and all other life forms will go extinct, and the universe will implode upon itself and return to the cold nothingness it once was. The end. Not such a happy ending, is it? Certainly not that good old, and they live happily ever after. Actually, not such a happy beginning, or middle, for that matter. The Bible tells a radically different, and perhaps you will find a more believable story. More believable because it harmonizes with our deeply embedded sense that we are something more than mere animals. We sense that we are conflicted creatures who have fallen from some elevated position of moral dignity and that we were fraught with immense potential for relational bliss. So what does the Bible teach us regarding the identity of mankind? Let's start with the very first verse of the Bible. Let's go to Genesis 1 verse 1. Genesis of course is the very beginning of the Bible, and of course, Genesis means beginnings. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's how the story begins. Chapter 1 of Reality opens with an intentional creative act of a personal God. As the creation account of Genesis unfolds over the course of six days, 
A beautiful material environment takes shape until the climax. The capstone is put in place. Let's read Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Just across the page. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here we see that the image of God is composed of both man and the woman as a relational unit with the ability to procreate a growing community of third-party relational circles. This makes total sense because we have previously discovered God is a relational circle rather than a solitary self. In other words, as we are told in 1 John 4.16, God is love, which means that God is a self is self-giving and other-centered. So when the Bible says that human beings are creatures of the divine image, it means that we possess the capacity to love like God loves. Think this through. As God ventured forth with creation, only three conceivable possibilities lay before him. He could create machines, slaves, or free moral agents. Only the third option would be consistent with the aspirations of love. So, here we are, beings of huge and magnificent significance, beings who possess the power to create real effects by our choices, effects that ripple into eternity with never-ending impact. We are beings endowed with the astounding uniqueness of individual personhood, are we as individuals truly significant to God? Let's take a look at a few verses. First, let's read Psalms 139, 1 through 13. Again, we're going back to the middle of the Bible, and we're going to Psalm 139. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For not is a word on my, there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me such knowledge is wonderful to me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will hold me. And if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide you, but the night shines as the day, and darkness and light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. Now let's read Acts 17. 26 through 28. Acts, of course, is in the New Testament, just after the book of John. Acts, chapter 17. And I'll be reading verses 26 through 28. And he has made of one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling, so that they should seek the Lord, 
in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, your own poets, have said, for we are his offspring. And finally, let's go to the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 30, excuse me, 29 to 31. Chapter 10, verses 39, excuse me, 29 through 31. And are not two sparrows sold for a copper, copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. There are several more verses that you can look at on this topic, including Psalm 56, 8, comma, Jeremiah 31, 3. The answer is clear. Not only are we significant to God, but he knows everything about us. He pays very close attention to us. Each human being's life carries what Paul calls an eternal weight of glory in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. In other words, we each carry a weight of moral and relational significance that only eternity itself can measure. The influence exerted by each of our lives will never reach final calculation, but rather will ripple forever with effect. It lies within our power as human beings made in God's image to actu actualize events and relationships of everlasting beauty that cannot come to pass apart from our individual choices. Every act of love that we perform constitutes an infinite moral good that makes a difference to the course of history and therefore to the eternal scheme of reality itself. If you speak a word of encouragement to a heavy heart, it matters in the grand scale, grand and infinite scale. If you visit a sick person and envelop their heart in compassion, that indeed means something of staggering eternal worth. If you feed a hungry child, doing so constitutes a crucial experience of generosity in that child's existence as well as in God's existence as the one who loves that child himself. It is a marvelous and weighty thing to be created as a human being in the image of God. Atheism is becoming increasingly popular in some circles due to the story of evolution being told by secular science. But is this rational to dis rationally sound to deny the existence of God? And what are the implications of doing so? If God does not exist, then human beings are nothing more than biological animals. Mere material creatures governed by the instinct of self-preservation, here today and gone tomorrow. To accept this view of human identity would be to accept that life has no ultimate meaning, that the moral categories of good and evil do not actually exist. We would be accepting that all our notions of compassion, justice, and goodwill are false constructs we've made up and that love is merely a powerful illusion. But we sense in our inmost hearts that this is not the case. Consider this challenging insight from the Bible regarding atheism. Turn with me to Psalm 14.1. Now you recall Psalms is approximately the middle of the Bible. Psalm 14 verse 1. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. 
this text is not meant to be a demeaning jab at the atheist, but rather a rational observation regarding the logical incoherence of atheism. Of course, many intelligent people refuse to believe that God believe in God because religion has often made God appear ugly and only worthy of unbelief. But here in Psalms 14.1, the Bible is offering an analytical observation regarding the general foolishness of denying God's existence. It is foolish to say there is no God, for the simple reason that if God did not exist, it would never occur to us to wonder if he does. The fact is, only that which occurs in some form occurs to human awareness, and some thing, and things that do not exist can never occur to our awareness. It is impossible for the human mind to conceive of anything that has not absolute that has absolutely no basis in reality. No negation statement is ever absolutely true. We cannot say completely, complete this sentence, there is no whatever, without reference to existing realities. Even when we construct our wildest fictions, we have simply reassembled pieces of things that do exist. That fact that we conceive of God at all is evidence that a God of some sort does exist. It is also intellectually incoherent to deny the existence of God for the simple reason that we all know life does have meaning, that good and evil do exist, and that we long for a trustworthy quality of love that finds no perfectly satisfying match in the current moral order of our broken world. Atheism, therefore, is counterintuitive and requires an intellectual and emotional leap away from what we know we are meant to be. We all have nagging suspicion, a divinely planted intuition that we are meant to be creatures of astounding nobility and that evil, suffering, and death are unnatural intruders. We can't help but wonder if the reason we so perfectly, persistently long for something more is because there is something more. There resides within us a sense of eternal realities that we find very difficult to shake off. Because we were made in the image of God, we can never truly be satisfied unless and until we return to God, and only God can fill the God-shaped hole in our hearts. The key word in this study is image. We've seen that God made mankind in his own image. As we fast forward into the New Testament, we encounter strategic uses of the word again, this time pertaining to Jesus Christ as a new and restored manifestation of what it means to be human. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of God. Hebrews 1, 3 states, that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Jesus now carries the descriptive title, the image of God, because he is, in his humanity, the new pattern man. He is, as it were, a fresh enactment of human experience, living once again in God's love as originally intended. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15.49. You'll recall 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. And if you'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. And now we are born the image of man of dust, as we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, through identification with Jesus, we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam. We also bear the image of the heavenly man, 
Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul explains that the image of God may be restored in us through coming into a trusting association with Christ. As we behold him, we will be transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And behold Jesus simply means to contemplate, examine, and become acquainted with his character and teachings. As we engage our hearts and minds in the transformative task of beholding him, the Bible promises that God's image will take on new and living form in our lives. Well, you've just completed Bible Study 3. If you found this interesting study, you can find more serious resources on this topic by clicking on the additional resource button below. You will find even more in-depth studies. You will find archived sermon videos as well as other instructive videos as we add them. Or if you prefer, you could simply talk with our pastor, Cliff Gleason. Pastor Gleason wants to be your spiritual resource and he does answer both his phone and email. So feel free to contact, contact him with any of your questions or comments. His phone and email are at the top of this page. May God bless you as you continue on to the next study. May you continue to connect with Christ.